Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Mike Armstrong podcast show. And uh, this evening, or afternoon stateside, uh, we're joined by Sion Nanton, who is a poet from uh, NYC, New York City. So uh, how are you doing today, uh, Sion? You okay? Hey, yeah. What's up, Mike? I am doing super. Um, It's a rainy day here in New York, uh, so there isn't really much getting out. And at work, we're all remote and the workday is over. So I'm just in for the day. Okay, good. So yeah, nothing much uh, happening this uh, this evening. So I guess you'll be on Clubhouse then, because that's uh, that's where we met. And uh, are you uh, are you on there a lot? Yeah, I'm on Clubhouse a lot. I um a lot of times I tend to look and see where the poetry may be, but I also check out uh, rooms like the Creativity House and um and Clubhouse. And then I saw this uh. The, this uh, screw small rooms uh, room no, that screw, was on. Screw the big rooms. Screw the big screw rooms. The, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Screw the big rooms, rather. Screw the big rooms. I saw screw the big rooms on there. I said, oh, man, that must be it's uh, pretty interesting. So I was listening to some folks talk about all manner of things, including, um, you know, uh, s- soccer, as we call it in the States, football, as it's called everywhere else. They were talking a little bit about that, which is one of my favorite sports. Um, and they were just talking about creativity and the like. And so it was just really interesting there. So I just hang out on Clubhouse a lot of times, especially if, you know, my students are like independently reading and I have no reason for my mic to be on. I just like, you know, listen on Clubhouse. Sometimes I'll participate, sometimes I wouldn't, but I'm, I'm there quite often. Yeah, good. Well, you know, for creative people and for networkers and collaborators and all that sort of thing, it's, a, it's an awesome place because, you know, you can teach and you can learn and you can chat and you can listen and you can, you know, collaborate. And, you know, it's just, you know, so much creativity, so much knowledge, so much information you can gain. You've got to be careful where you get your information from and, you know, make sure you go into genuine people and genuine sources um but uh but yeah you know my, my whole experience is i generally don't go to a lot of the rooms i just set my room up 24 7 and people come to me and uh yeah i love to learn uh off other others i love to meet people from all over the world and luckily i seem to attract people from all around the world and from all sorts of sectors and i'm not you know just into one thing or another i'm into everything so i just keep learning and expanding my knowledge and my contacts and my connections just by standing still and just waiting for people to come in, like, you know? Yeah, the best thing, because the best thing what it does is it broadens your um, your horizons. And that's kind of what, one of the things I really felt about the platform is that it, it, gives, it gives it a more genuine feel because a lot of times when you have, you know, video platforms like, uh, like TikTok or things like Instagram, a lot of times there is a certain level. It's not a knock on anybody that likes those platforms, uh, but it it's like a certain level of rehearseness, a certain bit of the fact yeah. that it's staged there. Whereas, you know, you are on a mic, you are just going off the cuff. Yeah, yeah, it's unplanned, unscripted, unrehearsed, unedited, yeah. you know, unphotoshopped, <laughs> all of those things. It's just, you know, live, raw, and, uh, you know, real, really. It's just in your face, real. And that's what I like about yeah. it as well. So, uh so yeah, so tell you know, us a little bit about um, the poet. You know, you're a poet. Uh, you like all the po- poetry rooms. Tell us, um, you know, how you got into poetry and and what you now do as a poet. Right. So um, I started, like, I started writing. I would say uh, where I consider where I started really considering my work as uh, something I might want to read later on uh, was back in. Uh, back in the day when I was like 14 years old, I was around the same age of my students. And I started getting into it and I started writing things. And I initially started writing like, you know, your more rebellious pieces, your more rebellious kind of poetry, because, you know, I, I was really fighting the power as it were, fighting the authorities, um, so to speak. And uh, the authorities was represented in the person of my principal. So, so I had a lot of anti-principle poems back in the day. And, uh, and uh, you know, nowadays I have taken it more seriously uh, down the time. I have a podcast called Haiku Vibes. And what I do with that is haiku is one of my favorite forms of poetry. 
And during the pandemic, you know, it was a really trying time for all of us mentally throughout the world. Um, and what I decided that, you know, I wanted to do was really just sort of create something, you know, calming and to be able to share my haikus in, in a way that gave, you know, one minute meditations and breathing exercises. Cause I figured, okay, maybe if I can help one other person, that would be, that would be great if I can help one person uh, to, you know, relax and focus with a haiku and a little breathing exercise. And since then the, the show, the episodes have really refined, they've really grown in a way that I did not envisage back when I started it last uh, summer in 2020, you know, my, I got a more serious mic setup and even, and just really started taking it a lot more uh, seriously. I also have two uh, collections of poetry that are, um, that are out. The, those were independently published and I have a manuscript that is uh, not independently published, uh, you know, and I'm just waiting for words and stuff on that. You know, you have a lot less control when you don't independently publish. So I just have to wait for word on when uh, that release is gonna come out. But my current uh, publication is called Psychedelic Mixtape. And that has, that, that doesn't have much to do with haikus. And I really kind of want to capture the spirit of like the Beatles and Bob Dylan and kind of talk about some of the stuff that they talked about uh, there and really just brought a, a sort of modern twist on the psychedelic era of music. The psychedelic era is really what inspired that uh, book. So I called it a mixtape because it's a, just a mixture of different poetic styles, different types of poetry and that. Um, so that's what psychedelic mixtape would be. So that's available just about uh, in any bookstore, especially if you're shopping online, you know. Um, like Amazon uh, and all those. Amazon and all those, my friends in the UK would see it on Waterstones as well, yeah. uh, you know, and and I have it available at Barnes and Nobles here in the States. Yeah, okay, so good. Yeah, that's, well, that's a little bit of there. what. Yeah, I'll see if I can find it and listen or look look at some of the work or whatever. So that, that's interesting, you know, a mixtape because, you know, a lot of uh, music these days is mixed from the past and, you know, re-edited and re reformulated and, and that sort of thing. And you're doing the same with the poetry styles and the words. So, you know, that's interesting. Yeah. And, 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 just, and just to be clear, like, you know, as I said, I had originally written the works and so on, but I have did a lot of a lot of listening to music. As I um as I wrote these um, you know poetry and all of that and um, and to just get into the frame of mind of that culture the the late sort of '60s psychedelic sort of cannabis and and anti-authoritarian sort of poetry culture, you know that's kind of the vibe that you're gonna get from that book. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, yeah. you mentioned about haiku uh, poetry. Explain uh, to those uh, less in the know. Uh, explain to them what that is, what type of poetry is, and and, and maybe some examples of it, etc. Sure, absolutely. So, um, well, haikus are a Japanese style of poetry. Um, generally speaking, like in uh, Japan, which is a more like intonation language, a language of intonation. Uh, it's broken up a little bit differently. English haikus, we always talk about syllables. So five, seven, five yeah. is like your general haiku. That's the format that I use for all of my haikus and I write them in English. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, so it's like that generally speaking, if you're gonna go traditionally, you wanna start off with a theme of nature. Um, something from the natural world you pull from. So I use a lot from the natural world in my uh, in my haiku, and I can actually read one of uh, one of the haikus I have in a current episode rather than just playing it. Uh, so to kind of give you a sense of of how that of how that goes, if um, if that's all right with you. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, perfect. So. And the cool thing is on the podcast, I have, um, I had my wife read a few of them as well, just to kind of give a female voice to yeah. some of the poems. She really, she volunteered to do it. And I thought that she has a, uh, 
a great voice. So I said, why not? You know? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to bring her in on, on what you're doing as well, get her involved. Yeah, man, make it a family business. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm going to read this one that I wrote. She actually performed it on the podcast, um, but I wrote this one and it's called, uh, it's called Focus on Water. So here goes. Focus on water. Listen to its spirit call and go with the flow. So as a haiku that fits the 575 model, uh -huh. um, it, it fits into the 575 model. But, mm -hmm. you know, on the actual podcast episode, you know, I have like sounds of streams and, and things like that going around. Um, it was recorded. I, I even uh, play with the sound of the singing bowl, the Tibetan singing bowl. And then I have like the, the breathing cues so that the breathing cues sound, sound kind of come in between the lines and at the end of the poem. So it kind of just allows the user to participate, you know, while breathing it sounded, along. Um, yeah, it sounded a bit part. like a meditation, uh, you know, the sort of meditations you get on uh, YouTube, you know, help you sleep or whatever. It sounded a bit, you know, that Ab inclined. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, and the way that I kind of thought about it, I was like, well, you know, we have all these different sort of meditation apps, all these sort of different things. But I said, you know, one minute, two minutes out of someone's day, it's not a lot to ask. You know, um, it's not a lot to ask. And it's something that somebody can easily do. Like I had a friend of mine tell me like, you know, I listen to it sometimes in the car or after work. Like, you know, I, I get in the car just, you know, putting my things away. I listen to it um, before I get started driving. Yeah. And one of the things I included in my introduction is, is, you know, I say, find a comfortable place and whatever. I said, do not. Do not drive. Uh, yeah. do, do, do not close your eyes when you're driving. You know, focus yeah. on the road. You can listen to it, but focus on the road. You know, I don't want any car accidents and, I've, yeah. and I absolutely don't want to be responsible for any either. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, so, th so there's that. I really do, do like that people are getting something out of it. And as I said, no matter whether I wind up getting a, a situation where I'm getting 5,000 downloads, I don't have that. But if I end up in a situation where I'm getting 5,000 downloads per episode, that's awesome. But if I can really find somebody that's truly reached, like one person that I can truly reach with it or two people that I can truly reach, I mean, honestly, like that's the job done because who knows how many other people that that one or two people can reach. Like if I change someone's day with a haiku, and they go out and change someone else's day. You know, that's kind of just my feeling toward it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. You know, I don't go chasing the numbers myself. I um, I have interesting chats with people from all around the world. You know, a lot of them are networkers. You know, so other some of my audience who are other networkers might want to collaborate with them. So if one person collaborates with one with one person, then that could become a joint venture. That could employ thousands of people you just you just never know do you you never know what the what the effects are of something so i just think well just do just do it if you enjoy doing it do it don't worry about the effects whatever the effects will be is what the effects will be you know what i mean you can't control it just just enjoy what you're doing and and watch and, and wait and see and i've luckily i've been told by people you know oh, i enjoyed that or that helped me do this or that helped me with that or you know you inspired me to do this well great you know, that's the good feedback. And then, you know, you're doing a good job, but I do it because I like it and I do it because I can and I never go chasing the numbers. And I think, you know, you seem to be on the same, the same path as well. Just do it. If you're going to help one person, you've helped one person. If you can help 10, even better. If you can help a hundred, even better. If you help a million, even better. But it doesn't really matter as long as you're enjoying yourself and you're helping someone and you'll always help someone. You'll always, you know, if you, if you do something long enough, someone will, find benefit in it and and you know the one of the interesting things uh that i heard in one of the rooms that i was in in the club pod room which is a, a podcast room um or club pod uh club actually they have a bunch of rooms going all the time yeah. anyways um with with them is i heard one of them talk about real influence versus like you know the skewed numbers that social media uh makes you feel you know, and 
one of the things I said, like if you have, let's say 500 people engaging with you, right? Sure, that might not sound a lot when someone's talking about like, I have 200,000 listeners and so on. But, you know, the person said, like the presenter said, imagine 500 people coming to your living room to hear you speak. Yeah. You know, and if you have 500 people in your living room to hear you speak, that's a lot of folks. You know, you have 10 people in your living room to hear you speak, and there could be a lot of influence because those 10 people could be, you know, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, the president of the USA. You know what I mean? You just, you know what I mean? You could be speaking to 10 people and you could be influential. You could be speaking to two people and be influential. You know? Abs- absolutely. But as, as it was like, you know, social media, um, you know, and of course, like they have their own things because it's all about advertising in yeah. terms of social media. Um, so, you know, so they, they need to have the numbers skewed in that kind of way, you know, but I, I know people even with like 10, 15,000 followers who barely engage with, with their followers, you know? Um, so it, and it's just really like, I I don't really feel there's much of a transaction. That's why a lot of times I want to, I ask people, especially when I come across people on Clubhouse that listen to my podcast what are you thinking? You know, maybe, maybe leave a review because that's going to help me be a better podcaster. Having 15, 16,000 followers, why that would be great and why I would love that. Um, having 16,000 followers that all they do is listen and they don't really give me any kind of feedback or no engagement. I mean, that's not really helping me be a better content creator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I always think it's good for people to give feedback anyway. Even if like they didn't love it, just say, Oh, that was that was good. You know what I mean? Just put some positivity into the world, in- encouragement for other people. You know, you have you have all this um uh, what's this somebody on the uh, social currency. You know, you have all this social currency, and some people are spending like a pound a day, you can spend millions of pounds a day just donating your social currency to other people by giving them comments and getting involved sharing their content engaging with them spending your money you can spend an infinite amount of money on 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 creating social engagement but some people don't do any engagement it's just like well you know you have all this unlimited fund and you're not spending any of it yeah you know it's 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 interesting um you know, it's interesting because because people do do that and it can cost a lot of time. And you got to like the thing that I find is, you know, people tend to be more conservative with their money and more liberal with their time. Yeah. And, you know, the money you get it back, but the time you really can't. No. You know, so so I would say, OK, you know, if this isn't if this isn't worth it for you and the other person, maybe you want to reexamine. Mm. You know, so. Yeah. um but at least at least that's that's like the like my take on it. So I usually go and I moderate. Um, I'm going to be moderating a room tomorrow. Um, you know uh, about like that's a poetry open mic sort of room, and I love going to those things because, you know, you can't really. It's hard to really say you know I'm a poet and I'm doing all of this stuff without consuming poetry, yeah. right? just like being a musician without consuming music, it's it's going to be difficult really because you're going to lose a lot of your way in terms of inspiration if if all you're hearing yeah. is your content and nothing else. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Everyone needs to be inspired uh, by others. Like, you know what I mean? So in fact, I was going to ask you what sort of poetry do you like listening to and who inspires you in that? But before I go into that, uh, tell us mm. a little bit about this poetry room. And, uh, you know, obviously, if it's a regular thing, then, you know, this isn't going to be published in time for tomorrow, but it'll be published in time maybe for next week or the week after or whatever. So tell people well, the room and, and what it's all about. Well, absolutely. It's So um, I am working with Creativity House. Um, I actually just, uh, just got a couple of contacts there. So... Um, it's going to be one of their rooms and they invited me to, to guest moderate, but I'm getting the feeling that they may want me to do a regular moderation with them. And the interesting thing is, so when I was at the club hot and the same gentleman, Chris, that was telling me about real influence versus this uh, social media numbers game is he said, you know, he said, I remembered you in a poetry room. He said, you gave a poem called confessions of a mirror. Now this is from my forthcoming collection. 
Um, and it's something that I only really give in an audio format. So it's nowhere on my Instagram. It's nowhere on my Twitter. You know, this is a poem that I only have been performing uh, with a collection coming out. And so he says, you know, I remember that uh, thing. And he's like, that was over a week ago. And he's like, and I have 100,000 followers and all of these other people. So I said, wow. I said, you know, that's the one person I wanted to reach, I guess. So he told me, he said, get in contact with David at Creativity House. And, you know, you were in his room and so on. See what's going on there. Anyways, long story short, I was able to get this. He says, you know, hey, I need you to co-moderate uh, this. It's one of the bigger poetry rooms on Clubhouse. And you really seem to know your stuff about poetry. And I'm like, ah, shucks. And he asked me to, uh, to go on and moderate with him uh, tomorrow and to sign up for it because they're a real club outside of Clubhouse. Yeah. They're a real club. They're a real creativity net network. Yeah. So I signed up for them, joined them, and moved forward that way. Yeah, good, good. Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a club uh, that started on Clubhouse, but I've actually, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to do a real world event in August uh, called Screw the Big Rooms. Uh, in a Martello Tower in Essex uh, in August. Like so, so we're going to be a, a, a real world club that formed out of Clubhouse. Um, but I always say to people as well, if ever you want to set up a room under my room, under Screw the Big mm. Rooms, you know, I'm always looking for people to set up different niches because that draws more people into my club. It also means that you can benefit off my club to start your room so you're not starting from scratch. So if ever you want to do a sort of a random poetry room or you know creative room or something like that, I'm always happy for people to do that on my club as well. So just, just and and see know. and see, I love I love like the like what really caught my attention with your club was when it said screw the big rooms, and uh and I said yeah you know let's see let's see what they're talking about if you're having a really potent conversation because there's been some times that I've gone to especially you know this is not a knock on anyone who likes to go to the marketing rooms but people who go to the marketing rooms like you have some of these huge marketing rooms with almost like a thousand people in them and they're barely talking about anything or all they're saying is just really a bunch of business jargon that maybe somebody maybe a few people who graduate with MBAs might be able to understand but it's not really giving too much to the general listener so you know so sometimes I'll get confused and I would leave such a room yeah. even if they may be giving uh, giving good insights so I thought it was awesome because, you know, people were kind of talking about different things from everything from football to Lebanon to poetry and whatnot in the small room. And I like that. Like for me, for me doing a poem in a smaller room is kind of like, you know, when you have these big musicians, like, you know, um, yeah, like you Rolling stage, Stone. Yeah, or you do like a small and, intimate gig, like, you know, and the small and so, intimate and the, gig is much more exactly. intense, like, you know. Exactly. Like when, uh, yeah, like when, when, uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite records that I like to hear, um, and, and, uh, records albums that I like to hear is, uh, is the live performance that Nirvana did their unplugged performance, their MTV unplugged performance. And, you know, that was, you know, it wasn't like a tiny venue, but it was a pretty small venue considering where they were on the world stage at the time. It was a really small venue. You're talking about something that held less than a hundred people and they have acoustic guitars and they're performing their hits. And something like that is really just kind of gets you back into the enjoyment of the music rather than just the whole production. And a lot of times I feel that when I go into a smaller room like that or something like poetry and discussions, I would just be able to really give that. And then if people want to ask me questions about a piece, it's a lot easier as opposed to when you're in a big room, you just perform and then you yeah. you perform your set and get off the stage. Yeah, well, that's the, <laughs> you know? the benefit of the little room is that, you know, if, for example, like I, I got some top level marketing knowledge I drop every now and then, not all the time because mm. I'm socializing a lot of the time and then my friends and I want, well, I want to get to know other people. But, you know, people that ask me for advice every now and then and I'll drop some bombs. And um, but the good thing is, is that if I unlike with a big room, if someone's dropping some knowledge, you don't understand them, you can't really do anything about it. Whereas with me, you could just say, oh, Mike, what, what did you mean by that? Or whatever. It's interactive. It's engaging. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so therefore, it's much more 
it's much more intimate and much more I consider valuable. You know, I treat people like um, the valuable human being that they are, rather than just another number to sort of like you know get through to, to get through to someone else. Like you know, Ab- absolutely, because every every number is is somebody's life, and so that one person you may have fifty thousand followers, but to each of that fifty thousand, you know, that's their life. That they're they're that one person. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and as long as, you know, as long as you're reaching that, like one of my, my attitude towards poetry has even changed with the advent of Clubhouse and just as it's grown and been able to host a lot of live events during in the pandemic, which is what I think is the true beauty in the platform, um, is I was able to perform a lot of different gigs, a lot of different events. So I've been really sort of treating myself more as a musician rather than a, with the air of a poet. Yeah. Yeah. That makes any sense. Yeah, definitely. And you know, like there's a there's like a thing where you can like combine say classical instruments like guitars and stuff and play like, you know, rock classics and that sort of stuff. I reckon there's yeah, there's there's a way of doing poetry that you can, you know, make it um sort of funky and cool and stuff as well obviously a lot of a lot of rapping and a lot of rap battles is funky and cool and all of that but um Mm. but it could be derogatory a bit and it could be not very good content and all of that but i think i think there's a way as well of you know sticking to traditional roots and doing poetry that way but also you know coming up with some sexy poetry of um you know hitting a bit of popular culture and making it cool you know so yeah, so like it's interesting you said sexy poetry. Like so, when um, my very first collection that I wrote, and it took me the longest to write, um, was a poetry collection called Taboo, and um, and it and that's also available where you get where books are sold, and that came out uh that that was written back in like 2016, and it was really just a fixed form poem, yeah. a re- really short poems, but they were like your love poems in the first half of the books and like your more erotic stuff in the second half of the book. Uh, So I always love to play with poetic forms as well and sort of just, you know, see what I can do with with music and poetry. And even if I'm not using a musical background, I would give the, sometimes even just changing the cadence and how you deliver a poem can make the, can give the poem an entirely different feeling. Yeah. And some songs are really good as poems, aren't they? Some songwriters are really yeah. poetic and some, you know, more formulaic or whatever, like, you know, but um, are there any sort of songwriters or artists who write their own songs and now that you really think, oh, they've really, they're really like... They have really inspired me. Poem, well, like, you know, yeah. Well, well, I can only one person pops into my head right now and uh, the per and it's obviously way way it's obviously a little bit before my time in terms of like his hey his biggest heyday but but the legend of bob dylan yeah um I, I got a funny story about um about something to it so um i was really heavy like into zen buddhism some um when i was in college and so when i was uh when i was doing that i uh, um I had, you know, they would do like different chantings and sometimes we would go to other people's houses and so on and just like have like a sort of like evening kind of chant or whatever uh, with some friends, sit around with some friends and whatever else. And so we were in this woman's house and I'm seeing all of these pla- plaques, you know, one or two platinum plaques and memorabilia and that. And it was Bob Dylan memorabilia. And that's when I was really discovering Dylan at the time uh, of my life. Like the Dylan and the Buddhism had nothing to do with one another. Um, and so, um, so I saw that and it turned out that she was, a, was Bob Dylan's assistant for a number of years back in the day. Yeah. Uh, and so she had given me a signed lyric book, which I still have to this day. I, I treasure it. It was completed um, in the 90s in the late nineties. So a lot of his, you know, like, like post year 2000 work, more current albums, that stuff is not going to be in there, but the lyrics, I mean, you can just read them off as, as their poetry by itself without the music. So, uh, so yeah, Bob Dylan yeah. Um, is one person who I would say if I, if I can count one person that I have a lot of, that I've gotten a lot of influence from, um, it'll be Bob Dylan and then, um, and the Beatles, yeah. Uh, the Beatles was another funny one. Um, I had uh, 
it, it was a it was a cannabis experience that I had one time, and so I woke up, and I'm hearing, uh, and I had my Spotify on uh, at the time, and this is to go goes to show you. So I had my Spotify. This is a few years back. Open, and it was just on random psychedelic stuff and then i'm hearing i am the walrus i am the Eggman, cuckoo cuckoo and i said oh my gosh <laughs> and then i became hooked on the beatles yeah you know uh ever since with that time so that's my more my more like classic rock like late 60s sort of influences and modern influencers um that i have now i have modern influencers influencers in rock and i have uh in terms of like hip-hop so like for hip hop, um, rap music is uh, Kanye West. I think like, you know, he's he doesn't suit everyone's taste, but he is because like he he's like his level of confidence, his wordplay, and so on. That's really really the things that has attracted me to his music is just like the level of confidence and the wordplay. Uh, <laughs> so, so I would say there's um, there's that and and modern rock, you know. Uh, Modern rock, I listen to everybody from uh, from Slipknot um, to John Mayer and um, and Jack White. You know, those are uh, those are quite a few people that I can um, think about um, because Slipknot some really heavy hardcore stuff, but uh, Corey Taylor is an excellent an excellent excellent writer. So those are the kind of music that I that's in my library that kind of gives me inspiration. And are there any poets? Are there any poets that are um, inspiring you or doing great things that you admire from afar or whatever? Um, yeah, there are there are several um, there are several poets that uh, that I tend to um, that I tend to look at right now. Let me just um, so one one person um, that she's no longer with us now is uh, Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver is. Um, I mean, she was a legend. I mean, she came out with so many books um, and so on. She's like a female Stephen King of poets yeah. in terms of the amount of work, the body of work that she's come out with. So um, Mary Oliver, um, Joy Harjo is another one. Um, she was the poet laureate two years ago um, here in the States. Um, so, she, so she was one that I look at, especially a lot of her, um, a lot of her interesting uh poems about nature and as a native american some of the interesting things that she uh has going on i also another person that i um that gives me inspiration as far as from a poetic sense is uh it was the book wilderness by um jim morrison um so you know so there's there are quite a few different uh styles of poetry that I uh, have been interested in. And I subscribe to, you know, poetry magazines and so on to just kind of get a pulse on exactly what is going on out there. I've bought a few things from, uh, a few collections from R.H. Sin. Now he writes a lot of like, uh, a lot of like love and pro-feminine type stuff. Um, so just really interesting uh, things that, that come from him and, I, I check a lot of contemporary poets too, but as far as the ones that really give me a lot of the inspiration, I would say Mary Oliver, Joy Hardro, Bob Dylan, yeah. just to name a few. Fair enough, fair enough. And um, you've obviously mentioned um, where people can go and you know subscribe to some of your work, etc. cetera. Um, how do they get involved? Do you get connected with you uh, online? You mentioned obviously Clubhouse. I think you might've mentioned Instagram. But just give yeah. you know, any web addresses or anywhere else you like to send people to. Oh, absolutely! So I would send, I would definitely send folks to uh, to my Instagram. I'm working on a um, on a website. I already have the web address, but you're not going to find anything there um, just yet. Um, the website is going to be is seeonthepoet.com or the hyphen poet.com. It will take you there. Um, on Instagram, I am see on the poet. On Twitter, I'm see on the poet. Facebook, see on the poet. Clubhouse, see on the poet. So I've just made it pretty easy for you guys to uh, go forward. See on the poet, I guess, is my stage name. Yeah. Uh, there is a uh, there's a rapper uh, that kind of that kind of inspired me 
in terms of like when I was thinking about a stage name and he, he's uh, Tyler, the creator, Tyler, the creator and Chance, the rapper kind of uh, influenced me as far as I'm like, OK, how what what stage name am I going to have? I'm a poet, so I'll just be Sion, the poet. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, I say I just found my stage name recently. Um, I've always, I, I used to have a company name. And then I marketed myself uh, and did my own personal branding, Mike Armstrong. And I've got a hashtag Mike Armstrong, which you can find me everywhere. But I, I actually got nicknamed the Welsh Dragon on Clubhouse. And I thought, actually, that's a good stage name for speaking because I fire, I, I breathe fire into entrepreneurs and inspire them and educate them and that sort of thing. So, uh, oh man, the Welsh the Dragon, that's dope. Yeah, I didn't find the name, the name found me, but it's, it's stuck now. So, uh, so that's what I use use from now on, like you know. So uh, my arms on the Welsh dragon, and uh, and that's what I'm going to. Yeah, on the ca- on the camera, I see the Welsh the Welsh flag right behind you, the Welsh dragon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, so uh, that's... people people don't know Wales as well as they do Ireland, and and Wales went like a Celtic cousin to Ireland. You know, it's not far away, just over the the sea, and everyone knows Ireland, but not many people know Wales, which is great for me because it's um it's like original. You know what I mean? It's going to be, uh, I can bring whales to the States and they don't know it. And I'm going to be the Welsh dragon on the stage speaking and inspiring and educating people. So that's my mission. But uh, yeah, great to uh, great to meet you, Sean, uh, Sion. And uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, great to have you on the podcast. And uh, thanks very much for coming on. I see your hands are busy now, so I'm going to call it a day. I say thanks very much for thank- coming on. Thank you very much for having me on. I much appreciate it. No problem at all. And have yourself a great day, okay? You too. Have a wonderful day. Cheers. Bye-bye.